Okej, då ska vi väl starta igång det här samtalet. Välkomna till Fredspodden Live, en seminarieserie i sju delar där vi kommer träffa olika experter inom olika områden för att diskutera kriget i Ukraina och olika aspekter av fred vid konflikthantering. Jag heter Rebecca Lindholm Schultz och jag programleder Fredspodden tillsammans med Svenska Freds ordförande Kerstin Berjo som jag har med mig i samtalet här idag. Och Rysslands fruktansvärda krig mot Ukraina genom den fullskaliga invasionen har snart pågått i två smärtsamma år. Kan inte du Kerstin börja med att säga något kort om varför vi gör den här seminarieserien? Det känns väldigt viktigt att så här när nästan två år har gått sedan 24 februari 2022 stanna upp och fokusera på de krav som Svenska Freds driver när det gäller just Rysslands krig mot Ukraina. Och vi har döpt den här live-serien till just Fredspodden Live Ukraina, sex, sam- sex krav, sju samtal. Jag är jätteglad idag att vi ska börja med en kontextanalys med eminenta Julia och Oksana som vi snart kommer släppa in och då kommer vi också gå över till engelska. Svenska Freds krav bland annat på att stoppa rysk gas som fortfarande köps och kommer in i Sverige. Det är ett krav som vi kommer titta mer på men redan nästa vecka kommer vi träffas fysiskt för de som är i Stockholm och titta mer på diplomatins möjligheter finns med våra kanske Sveriges främsta experter på det ämnet Isak Svensson professor i Uppsala universitet och diplomat Annika Söder så det får ni gärna komma till också då nästa vecka men vi kommer alltid köra online och vi kommer alltid ha frågor så att vi kan Mötas och lära oss mer om de här kraven som vi tycker är väldigt viktiga. Vi kommer titta på hur vi kan ställa Putin inför rätta, lära oss mer om det. Hur jobbar man med, hur kan man stötta fredsrörelser, icke-våldsrörelser, inte minst i Ryssland och Ukraina. Och det sista seminariet med Peter Wallensten kommer också titta på freder i historien. Finns det några nycklar där av andra freder? För att vi pratar ju oerhört mycket om krig just nu, såklart eftersom det är verkligheten. Men det är det. Vi vill helt enkelt använda oss och av den expertis och de experter som finns på respektive område. Och vi kommer starta igång redan ikväll för att lära oss arbeta hur vi kan arbeta så effektivt som möjligt för att ta de här kraven ett steg vidare. Ja, precis. Det handlar ju helt enkelt om att vi på olika sätt behöver prata mer om hur vi förbereder för fred. Och idag på det första eh, avsnittet i den här seminarieserien så kommer vi försöka skapa oss en bild av krigets kontext. Både eh, hur vi kan förstå situationen ur ett historiskt perspektiv men också hur det ser ut i Ukraina idag. Eh, och upplägget eh, kommer gå till så att vi börjar med att låta gästerna ha en inledande introduktion om deras arbete innan eh, jag och Kerstin kommer ställa eh, ett par frågor till båda gästerna och efter det släppa in er som lyssnar till att ställa frågor. Och ni som lyssnar kommer att kunna ställa frågor genom kommentars fältet i Facebook och det går bra att skicka in dem eh, allt eftersom så kommer vi att återkomma till dem i slutet och svara då på så många frågor som vi hinner för att vi också fått in ett par frågor eh, i förhand. Eh, jag vet att en av gästerna i alla fall är här hittills och nu hoppar den sista eller andra gästen in fantastiskt. Eh, så att vi ska väl egentligen börja med det egentligen eh, Kerstin att gå över till engelska och eh, välkomna dagens båda gäster. Warmly welcome, Julia and Oksana. Julia Yurichuk and Oksana Patapova, we are so delighted and honored to have you as our guests tonight and to be able to listen and learn from your experience. And we hope for some keys for better understanding this brutal war that is going on. 
Um, thank you again for coming. And as Rebecca said, we will focus first uh, on Julia's uh, expertise on, on the history of uh, Russia, Ukraine, and, and what has led to this horrible war. So with uh, this, um, I would will uh, invite you, Julia, to, to start. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very honored to be here with you. Thank you for the invitation. And, uh, uh, you know, as a historian, it's uh, very hard for me to understand where to start to explain the context. But uh, I will try to be short and concrete and only talk about the latest uh, decennium, maybe two decenniums, but not more, um, and uh, put it into a broader uh, context so that you that we all can follow what is going on uh, now and when why we have this um, uh, horrendous war uh, against Ukraine. So I want to start with a very simple and um, straightforward explanation and uh, I think that many of my uh, colleague historians would agree with it, um, I think. Uh, and the, this explanation is um, as follows. So Ukraine is fighting the war for independence. So if you read uh, Srihi Plohi, and uh, he is a historian of Ukraine at Harvard University, he writes a lot about uh, uh, this war and uh, he explains it also in a way that this is the war for independence. And I think this is the most um, straightforward way to explain it, what, what is going on, because during the 19th century, we had so many wars for independence. And now Ukraine has uh, the war for independence, which can be understood through this context. And this is an imperialist um, war for Russia, uh, who is not willing to let Ukraine go and be independent state uh, on its own terms. So the Russian elites, um, including Putin, uh, see themselves as um, uh, expansionist. Uh, they are expanding their power and they want to take hold on the territory and the people that they believe um, belong to the empire. So in a way, Russia is continuing its imperialist expansion on the coast of Ukraine, which started in the 17th century and even um, earlier. So, but I, I won't speak about the 17th, 18th centuries and all that. I will uh, strictly speak about the post-Soviet developments. And just I want to emphasize that each time Ukraine was trying to distance from Russian influence, there was uh, Russia meddling into Ukrainian affairs. But I, I want to just to add that it's not only into Ukrainian affairs. It's also, it also, for instance, in Georgia. We remember 2008, the war in Georgia, right? So each time the uh, former Soviet Republic uh, is trying to distance distance from the Russian influence, there is a problem. And uh, um, I think that uh, here, maybe if we have time for questions, uh, we can expand to the explanations why uh, the Baltic states uh, succeeded to leave this sphere and become members of uh, the EU and NATO, and Ukraine didn't. But still, just um, for us to remember that uh, each time Ukraine tries to leave this space of Russian influence, Russia is meddling into its affairs. And now we have this military meddling. And, uh, uh, and I should just say that uh, the war actually started on the 27th of February 2014, when Russian troops took over Crimean parliament. So it was the point when everything started. And just to, to maybe remind those of you who don't remember what was happening in 2014. Uh, so in 2013, uh, just to, towards the end of the year, Ukraine had uh, mass protests against this 
pro-Russian turn in Ukrainian politics. So millions of people came to the streets uh, in uh, big cities. And of course, the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest protests were in the capital, in Kiev. And that was the start of the revolution of dignity. And as a result of this revolution of dignity, pro-Russian president uh, Viktor Yanukovych left Ukraine, fled Ukraine to Russia. And, and as a result of all these movements, uh, Russia came and took over the Crimean parliament and annexed Crimea. And then the war started in this... Um, like localized war in the uh, east of the country. And uh, now we all know there, it is, uh, there, there are lots of evidence that uh, Russia was directly uh, like involved in this war. So in 2020, uh, in 2022, we have the escalation of war and we have now the second phase of this war. And this is uh, uh, what we, call very often in the media, uh, full-scale invasion, full-scale or uh, full-fledged war. And uh, just between 2014 and 2022, about uh, 14,000 Ukrainians were killed already uh, during this period. And um, there were a lot of uh, um, efforts to build peace, to, to have some peace. And uh, just uh, during 2015, there was uh, uh, these two Minsk agreements uh, were signed, but they never worked actually. So because uh, Russia violated them and was uh, uh, bombing um, uh, the cities and the towns in Donbass. Uh, so we should remember that the war is taking place exclusively on the Ukrainian territory. And if Russian troops leave the territory, there will be no war. And I, I think that many of you know, and if not, then I will just tell it uh, for you now. In Ukraine, we have a phrase that became proverbial. If Russia stops fighting, there will be no war. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no Ukraine. So this is as simple and as complex as uh, it is. So, and just a, a couple of words how uh, how history is used in the war. If we have uh, still some time, I will just uh, um, put it into the context because uh, Russia was always using history in its internal and external politics. And for me as a historian, it's something what, uh, what has been very interesting to follow. But uh, since uh, the war in Ukraine, it became uh, really terrible to follow. So, so we can speak about like, special memory operation in um, the War of Monuments, for instance, in the Baltic States in 2008. And this constant meddling with the, uh, the, with like, internal affairs of uh, independent countries. And uh, those of you who are interested in this question, you can read the book of uh, Jade McLean, Memory Makers, and she writes just perfectly about all these kind of memory operations and why, why history matters so much for Russian uh, Federation. And in a way, Russian uh, this war, Russian-Ukrainian war, is based on a quite perverse idea of history. And uh, many of you, I think, uh, heard about this uh, infamous essay on uh, uh, of Putin, actually. Uh, um, and this is the essay on Russian history, which he published just uh, a couple of months before the invasion. So it was um, July 2021. One, when he came with this piece of um, history, in his view, history, but it's like total, yeah, um, yeah, it's like, uh, it's nothing to do with history, really. So, and um, even this title of the essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians show what he meant, like really to, 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 prove that there is no Ukraine without Russia, without this uh, Russian unity. 
so it, that is why I'm saying that it is a very perverse understanding of history, uh, because he uh, he explains history as something that is given, as if it is up to him to decide where the destiny of the millions of uh, people. And here I I mean not only Ukrainians but also Russians, right? So Ukrainians, on the other hand, uh, show that history is made by every single person and every single decision matters and every single decision we make defines history. So it is a complete uh, a clash of understanding what history is. So history is not a given. And in a similar way, Ukrainians understand that the independence is not a given fact. And this is something what people are fighting for now. So they know for sure that history, uh, that independence is not really given. So, uh, in, but in a way, right, this speech or this essay of Putin uh, shows very well the Russian attitude towards Ukraine. So that there should be no Ukraine and no Ukrainian people beyond this Russian view of unity and uh, uh, Russian kind of dominance over this uh, territory. Uh, so uh, I think that um, uh, if we think about uh, uh, this more like, deeply, we can say that uh, uh, Russian views about this war, they are very much uh, grounded in uh, the past and this past, uh, this uh, understanding of the past doesn't really give uh, Ukraine uh, the chance to to develop and to have a future. So, the, uh, and this is really uh, like, um, uh, tragic for for Ukrainian uh, people uh, in many ways, of course. So, and uh, and just to end, uh, I have a little anecdote in the end, but uh, just to end it, I, I I believe that Russia is trying to build now, it's not a kind of a Soviet Union, it's something much, much worse. Uh, and um, it's not even a, a Russian empire, because even if it is a Russian empire, it is uh, already in a renewed form of the 21st century. And with all the technologies we have in the 21st uh, century, they use a lot of uh, Russian conservative thinkers. Uh, and even uh, fascist thinkers in their ideology. Uh, for instance, um, the ideology of uh, Ivan Ilyin, who was a kind of Chris uh, Christian fascist. And uh, in this ideology, any talk of Ukraine as a separate uh, state, uh, as a separate state from Russia, um, makes anyone a mortal enemy of Russia. Like uh, when you believe in Ukraine as a state, you are already an enemy of Russia. And by the way, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who got uh, the Nobel Prize, he also believed in it. So he really was very anti-Ukrainian in this way and very imperialistic. So I think that um, the, within Russian ideology today, it is OK for Russia to be totally isolated from the world because they are building this anti-world, anti-West, anti whatever, uh, because all the values which we share, and I guess we all who gathered here, we believe in democracy, in um, equal rights, in um, uh, feminism, in uh, LGBTQ rights, for instance, but it's something what is against uh, Russian ideology today. So just a final example, uh, and it was yesterday that I read the news that some of Russian soldiers, uh, when uh, um, store uh, gender neutral uh, toilets, uh, so this is the fact, in Ukraine. Uh, they posted photos of these toilets and wrote on social media that this is exactly against these outrageous uh, things they are fighting in Ukraine. So I believe it says a lot about the ideology and about the clash of ideologies because Ukraine uh, in contrast, really, what Ukraine wants to, to, to be, it, it, Ukraine wants to be an independent state, it wants to be a democracy, and wants to be a member of these Western structures uh, like the EU and the NATO now. So this is, I think, the context, and I will stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much, Julia. This uh, topic can't really fit into these minutes, but you did a great job. Uh, thank you so much. And I'll give the word you, to you now, Oksana, 
tell us uh, about you, who are you, and also about the situation. I think we move a bit from the history into the present uh, with you uh, working for women and human rights in Ukraine. It's an honor to have you here, and uh, the floor is yours, Oksana. Um, hello, um, and uh, thank you for welcoming me. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, there may be some background noise, but I don't know if you if you hear it or not. Uh, my name is Oksana Potapova. I am a women's rights activist um, and um, advocate of uh, Ukraine uh, abroad and uh, also a gender scholar and a researcher. And uh, yes, I'm here to maybe uh, speak more specifically about the things that Yulia mentioned in her um, at the end of her comments uh, that have to do with the uh, sort of gender dimension of uh, this war and why uh, we uh, need to think about uh, gender in this war as, as just as in, in any wars. Um, for me, as someone who came to Gender studies as a scholarship through activism and grassroots work um, for peace uh, and women's rights. Um, it became apparent at certain point uh, that uh, uh, peace as uh, a state, both as a political concept and also as an everyday practice, uh, is uh, very embedded in relations of power. Uh, and feminist analysis allows us to understand power relations on different levels. Uh, feminist work and scholarship also allows us to theorize from the everyday, from the invisible. And uh, a lot of um, uh, experiences uh, that are gendered are often invisible, even though every war is gendered and every crisis, every political process is always uh, gendered. I just uh, want to give several uh, illustrations of how this particular war is also uh, very connected to uh, gender power relations. Um, as uh, Yulia was already mentioning, uh, for Russian uh, foreign politics and for uh, Vladimir Putin specifically, uh, what they framed as gender ideology has been uh, from the very start part of construction of uh, the image of the enemy, um, uh, the West as the enemy and uh, gender ideology as a threat uh, to uh, the health of uh, Russian nation, um, while at the same time, and there is already uh, research uh, that is available uh, publicly, for example, by Dr. Leandra Baez, uh, that documents uh, a decline of uh, women's rights and gender freedoms within Russia over uh, the uh, extension of uh, Putin's uh, rule uh, that act actually was accompanied with the discourse of um, LGBT rights and uh, all this kind of democratic uh, Western freedoms being a threat. So we have seen in a way, uh, diverging uh, processes of democratization uh, and authoritarianism uh, within Russia and within Ukraine uh, happening and unfolding over the last actually 15, uh, 20 years. And this is also a very important um, point uh, that in order for us to identify and um, analyze uh, democratization of society, looking at uh, the progress around uh, gender freedoms and gender equality is very important. Uh, in Ukraine, we have been seeing this progress with um, women being a very active part of uh, the protests that Yulia was mentioning, the Maidan protests, and before that, uh, women's movements and organizations becoming active political subjects, uh, achieving um, various you know, rights and freedoms that uh, have been sort of pushed forward, like gender quotas uh, in parliament, uh, like the ban, um, the removal of the ban on all the uh, prohibited professions for women entering uh, the military service voluntarily and then being officially made uh, possible to do that. Um, and uh, that progress is inherently part of democratization uh, in the Ukrainian society. Uh, so, uh, along with also fight for LGBT rights. And uh, ironically, right now, during uh, the war, uh, there is um, 
uh, advocacy campaign for legalization of same sex partnerships in Ukraine, uh, which is something that uh, LGBT movement uh, has been fighting for for quite a while. Um, and when Putin uh, argument uh, argued um, that uh, gender ideology is uh, something that is moving from the West and creeping up on Russian borders uh, and uh, is threatening Russian culture. It was one of the discursive um, ways um, of justifying the military invasion. And uh, this is not something unique to Russia. Uh, unfortunately, we see that uh, the rise of authoritarianism and conservatism is very connected to the rollback on gender rights and freedoms. We see this in um, other parts of the world, uh, from Middle East to the United States. And uh, this is, in fact, uh, one of the indicators that uh, we, as uh, those who are <laughs> standing for democracy, working for human rights, need to be on the lookout uh, for. And um, this, uh, I think the case of uh, Russian uh, full-scale invasion is a case where this authoritarianism is exported abroad. And it's not only a case of a domestic policy anymore and uh, the decline of freedoms within a particular country, but it's also a threat to safety and security of uh, foreign states and of actually uh, global security infrastructure. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, security, feminist security scholars have been reflecting on uh, a lot over the last uh, two years. Uh, in fact, advocating for uh, more need of integrating gender as an inherent uh, indicator of security and sustainable peace um, that would allow us to potentially prevent uh, further conflicts uh, or uh, authoritarian regimes if we start seeing um, the decline uh, in this area as a sign of potential increase of violence, physical violence, political violence, and um, armed violence. And um, the other thing I was talking about is the everyday, um, which is uh, embedded in gender relations as well. And um, one of the uh, questions that uh, you shared with me leading up to this discussion to think about is, how is the war different for people who are uh, in the front line versus those who are sort of uh, living the, this, this, the civilian life? And having just come back uh, from Ukraine uh, after being there for uh, 10 days and also being closely in contact with uh, my family and also activist circles, I think um, more and more we can say that uh, the line between uh, those who live a civilian life and those who fight in the front line is very blurred. And this is also uh, something to know about the nature of, of the war in Ukraine. It's not a war that was started just by our government or by the military or was uh, propelled by our military. It's a war that is led and um, by the people. And uh, you, I think by now, will not find a single family in Ukraine who is not affected directly by either having a family member on the front lines or in captivity uh, or um, volunteering um, or supporting their family members um, or grieving the loss of a family member. And uh, so, some of those uh, relations, uh, of course, are also very gendered, um, but we also see uh, interesting tendencies towards disruption and dialogue and conversation. Uh, your classical feminist security scholarship would talk about uh, militarized masculinities and uh, femininity that uh, requires a more passive and a supportive role. And... Uh, because the draft in Ukraine is obligatory for men and is voluntary for women, of course, that tendency is there. However, um, we also do know that uh, Ukrainian army is um, one of the uh, includes one of the highest numbers of uh, women fighting um, at the moment, uh, while at the same time fighting for their rights in the military. It's a very interesting space of uh, politicization of the everyday that uh, has happened and that is happening also thanks to uh, the previously very vibrant and dynamic political process and, and feminist activism. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, both women veterans and women soldiers and uh, queer soldiers 
are fighting for more inclusion and uh, equality within the armed forces, they are also using their political position to advocate for uh, equality in the civic life, um, arguing that uh, the kind of Ukraine they are fighting for, we are all fighting for, is a Ukraine of equality, is a Ukraine where uh, civil partnerships are legalized, where um, domestic violence is not the norm, uh, where violence prevention uh, programs exist and advocate um, and and are implemented. Um, and a lot of work is being done at the moment by uh, women's rights organizations and uh, the feminist movement uh, in partnership with international uh, donors and uh, um, another interesting tendency is the horizontal uh, links and networks of solidarity that have emerged on so many levels, uh, but are also now uh, solidifying into a longer term uh, and very important transnational uh, connections and networks. Because exactly of uh, what I started with, this understanding of uh, the fact that uh, the kind of risks and challenges that that Ukraine is facing right now due to this war and due to this threat are not unique to us. And uh, we need to build uh, links between movements in, in other contexts, in other countries that are connecting issues of gender equality and security. Um, there are a lot of reflections as well around the imperial legacy of this war and uh, its decolonial dimensions, as Yula was mentioning, uh, between feminists and other types of activists and scholars from uh, the broader region. And um, I think those are uh, all very important uh, tendencies and those are very important reasons why this particular war needs to continue to be on the agenda of um, European states and uh, also brought it on the global agenda uh, because fighting it and uh, reminding the world what we are fighting for is in fact a way to keep democracy and to uh, hopefully ensure that we do not experience the kind of rollback that again a lot of feminist scholars uh, talk about uh, during um, during wars. Um, I think I can talk more, but maybe there will be more questions or comments. So I will stop here yeah. and yeah, uh, allow you to intervene. Thank you both for your introductions. And we're looking forward to hearing more from both of you, of course. Uh, I will start by giving the word back to you, Julia. Uh, how would you say that our understanding of history affects the war? And you talked about it a bit in your introduction, but uh, could you maybe elaborate a bit on in which which ways we can understand Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a result of imperialist or colonial ideology? Uh, yeah, um, I, I I really believe that this is uh, imperialist um, uh, war. As I said already, I mentioned that uh, uh, Russia sees it as an expansion and. Um, and Russia wants to have the um, this um, influence over the territory of Ukraine, and uh, also the ideology is uh, imperialistic. And uh, what is uh, uh, important to just underline that um, it's not only about ideology, and we see it that it's also strategy and tactics uh, of uh, con uh, conquering Ukraine, uh, which is imperialistic and uh, expansionist. Uh, because by killing um, and um, terrorizing civilians, uh, Russia shows that um, it doesn't care about lives and uh, the uh, objective is to eliminate uh, the Ukrainian like national existence, uh, national consciousness. And that is why uh, for Russia, it's so important to, dis uh, to destroy not only the uh, lives, but also uh, cultures or heritage. Uh, uh, and we see it uh, again and again that Russia is um, destructing uh, basically cul everything, culture included. Uh, and um, I think that um, this is a kind of um, imperialistic war uh, and this colonial tactics, which is not exclusive Russian, because in history we know that uh, empires have these tendencies of exterminating the others, the uh, people. So 
when the Russian government uh, uh, or media are speaking about um, the need to eliminate uh, all the people of uh, with Ukrainian consciousness, they put it in this words like all Ukrainian people with Ukrainian consciousness. Uh, so they directly use words like Ukrainian question, uh, final solution of Ukrainian question. So it leaves uh, no like the, no really space for imagination we already had it in history so why should we not believe in their intention really like so and i think that now after what we um discovered uh, in the Bucha, in Izum, and many other places which were deoccupied uh, what kind of um uh, crimes against humanity were committed there. So I think that uh, uh, this is um, really something which should show us uh, that it should be punished. So like, and, and history shows us that uh, such uh, crimes should be punished because if they are not punished, then they just repeat. Uh, so, yeah, I think that... Um, yeah, of course, hopefully Ukraine will deoccupy de de more and more territory, but uh, uh, my fear is that uh, what we will see in those territories, it will be even more uh, horrendous and uh, we will see more crimes. And uh, uh, that is why the, this question of uh, justice is, I think, uh, very important uh, for Ukraine and for the world, actually. Yeah, I agree. Justice is really important for uh, peace. Uh, Oksana, I will let you back into the conversation. You talked a bit about the situation in Ukraine and also um, how life is for Ukrainians who don't live at the front. But uh, I think it was interesting that you said that uh, civil versus military life is becoming more uh, blurred and the line between civil and military uh, life is blurred. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Um, uh, yes, it's uh, sometimes I forget uh, that how difficult it is maybe to imagine uh, this kind of a 3D experience of uh, living uh, in the state of ongoing war and I realized this uh, when I was quite actively uh, sharing my experience of traveling to Ukraine on social media over the last year and uh, contrast how my description of the reality contrasted the news. Because I realize uh, the news often show you only uh, photos of damaged uh, buildings you know, when there is an uh, air uh, alert or air explosion or um, photos from uh, the front line while um, uh, people have an impression that uh, either the whole Ukraine is like this, or uh, this is only one part of the country and the rest of the country is uh, completely safe. Uh, what I mean by this is that, of course, uh, the whole territory of Ukraine is uh, affected and there is no safety anywhere because uh, our airspace is uh, not um, uh, safe from uh, Russian attacks, Russian drones and Russian bombs. And this is why Ukraine keeps um, advocating uh, for military support, first of all, in order to strengthen our air defense. Um, just um, earlier um, this month, we have seen uh, some of the um, hardest uh, air attacks on Ukraine, uh, actually the, the biggest one uh, in early January with uh, several civilian deaths. And um, this is uh, something that has become uh, part of the norm for people uh, living their lives and uh, going to work and uh, uh, having to manage their uh, security situation um, at the same time. Uh, what I also mean is um, uh, that uh, everybody uh, who lives uh, in Ukraine and even uh, those who are living abroad right now is uh, temporary under temporary protection understand um, that their families are connected uh, to uh, and the future of Ukraine is connected to the result of uh, the military uh, struggle. Um, what Yula was mentioning about um, full awareness of the risks of occupation and risks of Russia being in control of certain parts of territories is very present um, in uh, people's minds. And uh, we all follow 
the news on a, a next uh, partnership agreement with uh, the country like the UK, for example, most recently, that continues to provide support. Um, this makes our war also very global and uh, geopolitical. And uh, in a way, uh, a lot of people who didn't used to be military experts or geopolitics experts have become so. Um, uh, what um, There are so many other ways that the war also affects uh, the everyday, uh, which includes uh, the uh, impacts on uh, uh, vulnerable groups and populations that have become uh, vulnerable uh, through displacement, uh, through loss of housing, through uh, being wounded or uh, disabled by um, attacks. Um, it also increases uh, gender divisions of uh, invisible uh, reproductive uh, labor, emotional labor, uh, care work um, that uh, mostly uh, women uh, tend to do uh, in situations of um, uh, need of, of this kind of work. Um, it um, calls for um, also a visioning of a different uh, kind of social policy and uh, during and after the war that uh, Ukrainian feminist movement is already advocating for, which is another ironic part of our reality is that while uh, the society is fighting a war and experiencing losses and uh, is becoming more vulnerable through uh, so many different impacts, we are also talking about the recovery and reconstruction at the same time. Um, trying to take into account um, the changing needs and realities of other society in the reconstruction. Uh, this is where uh, another level of support and solidarity and long-term solidarity is very important uh, for our whole society, but especially for civil society and for the feminist movement. Uh, we want to make sure that the reconstruction of Towns, cities, and uh, the recovery of Ukraine's uh, economy, uh, culture, um, and social policy is inclusive and is actually human centered, and it serves the interests of uh, everyday uh, uh, of of people who uh, have suffered and uh, also volunteered and contributed so much to uh, our resilience and to our victory. Uh, and that it doesn't only prioritize the interests of um, the government or those who make decisions or the big businesses that will uh, potentially profit of uh, privatization of public services and public goods. Um, unfortunately, um, these discussions are already happening at so many levels at the recovery conferences uh, that happen every year. And uh, our call for solidarity is to support and elevate uh, voices of civil society and voices of those who stay connected to the needs of, of different communities um, and um, advocate for an inclusive and intersectional um, recovery process um, in Ukraine. Um, because it uh, is uh, that kind of vision is rooted in the everyday. Uh, is rooted in um, understanding the needs and realities of communities on the ground, and it must become also a part of the vision for the whole society. Thank you very much, Oksana. That was uh, good for us to hear, I think. You take us, uh, make us understand the situation uh, in a in a very, very tough way though. Uh, Julia, uh, I think we, I have an interesting question, I think about information that you mentioned it, that it plays such a big role uh, in the war uh, in Ukraine. And uh, how can we deal with propaganda? How can we promote the truth? And I think that actually links to a question we have uh, received from Thomas Norberg. Uh, what is a Russian's population view on the war and how May history inform us regarding this. Uh, I think it might be linked. So, so I I give that question to you. Back to you, Julia. Yeah, it's indeed very uh, close question. So I will take up it. And um, just to um, confirm what uh, Oksana was saying in this uh, discrepancy of information, because. Uh, as a Ukrainian who reads uh, Ukrainian news, uh, uh, English uh, language news, let's say so, and Swedish news, uh, you really see the differences in how people, uh, and I mean like professional people speak about the war. And uh, sometimes these discrepancies are so 
you know, big that uh, it's like a dissonance in my head. And uh, I I would say that I'm I'm still struck that we are still under the influence of um, Russian information sphere so much because uh, uh, when we see who has uh, more space in the media, uh, it is still Russians, because uh, Russian writers, intellectuals, uh, even if they present themselves as uh, anti-Putin, they have uh, very little understanding of Ukraine, but still they are commenting Ukraine, and they have no understanding of wh what war is, but still they command the war. And... Um, I think that uh, uh, for me, uh, this is like not a problem uh, let, uh, if they want to let them speak, but the way they speak and like it's so striking that for them, even if they speak about Ukraine, it's uh, the most tragic thing is that uh, Ukrainians don't want to speak Russian anymore. They don't say that Ukrainians are exterminated in thousands, hundreds. No, they speak about, oh, they don't want to speak uh, Russian anymore. So it's uh, really very, very interesting. Uh, so that they continue speaking about uh, their own suffering. And I just uh, curious um, when they stop speaking about their own suffering and speak about something essential. So, uh, and, uh, and of course, this is me as Ukrainian speaking so i'm very triggered with all this kind of coverage and space they have still in in, in uh, the media so and uh, then i think as a historian what is also interesting for me is um, this question of truth uh, and uh, um and i can say that finally we realize that there is some truth right there is something what is true because um I I think that there was some kind of crisis of this term truth. Like nobody really believed that there is truth. Everything was very relevant, and uh, it's like basically our um, like um, time uh, time spirit is like uh, there is no truth, right? And I uh, think about uh, Peter Pomerantsev uh, book on actually Russian propaganda. And he uh, has this um, historical view on, uh, on the truth, actually. And uh, he says that uh, at uh, during the Soviet Union, during the Cold War, there was at least um, a hope and belief that if uh, the world will know the truth, then there will be the change. And that is why so many Soviet uh, intellectuals, dissidents, tried to uh, to uh, come with the truth, with something true uh, towards the uh, world to say what is happening in the Soviet Union, right? But what happened after the Soviet Union collapse, uh, it seemed that everyone just... Uh, didn't care what truth is, what whom the truth belongs, so to say, because like everything became so so relevant, and I still remember that um, like me being a historian who writes about Ukraine and who is from Ukraine, I was very often uh, very much of distrusted so i had really very little trust in what i'm saying because uh, of course you are from ukraine that is why if you are speaking about like the famine in ukraine you are very biased we all know there was no uh, such policies of the soviet union which was exactly against ukraine it's just you and your trauma speaking and this is it, it was happening like all the time even the peer reviewers were telling me you should put uh, holodomor and holodomor is ukrainian word for the famine in the quotation marks because it's a construction everyone knows it so <laughs> you can understand what it like means like when we speak about history and uh, who speaks about history uh, and and um, uh, yeah, and I think that uh, at least now what I feel that uh, the world starts to see what uh, Russia actually is and that it's not a joke that Russia wants to, to destroy Ukraine. And I think that it took so long, it took uh, eight years to the world to understand where truth is, what kind of propaganda, what kind of information to believe in. 
Yeah. Thank you so much for that. We don't have uh, much time uh, left. Time is running fast. Uh, so I will continue with the question from the audience. And I think that's one uh, that one is more for you, Oksana. And it's how does the war affect gender equality within Ukraine? Um. Thank you for this uh, question. And um, I already mentioned uh, some examples of uh, both challenges and opportunities. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there is extensive feminist scholarship uh, that, that says that wars uh, often create situations of uh, increasing inequality and um, backlash on uh, gender uh, rights and freedoms because of militarization and militarized masculinities, uh, the cuts of uh, funding to social infrastructure and social sphere. Um, and those are some of the things that uh, I'm sure feminists as researchers and activists are um, watching out for. Um, it is important to say that uh, Ukrainian society uh, was not uh, preparing itself for a war. Uh, there is a certain process of militarization that happens in a country that is actually uh, the government of which is trying to build a society to go to war. And we have seen this, uh, if we look back on uh, the Russian society over the last few years, this is a perfect example of how um, militarization and preparation for an expansionist and uh, invasionist war actually is built on um, uh binary roles of men and women men as defenders as uh, strong ones as the powerful ones and women as uh, weak ones in that regard um within the ukrainian society gender roles and for uh, between men and women but also the representation of queer persons has been uh increasingly more diverse uh there has been increasingly more space um uh, for uh, protests, for advocacy, for visibility. And uh, it hasn't stopped during uh, the war. Um, on the contrary, uh, that we have seen some very important gains, such as the ratification of the Istanbul Convention that happened uh, last year and that is now giving the ground uh, for uh, women's civil society to actually uh, put in place a very robust and comprehensive system of gender-based violence prevention and um, uh, address. Uh, we also see a very active uh, process around the, the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security that was updated uh, during the first six months of the Polskan invasion and is being vocalized and is uh, as an agenda is being picked up very actively by uh, feminist organizations. We have seen an immense growth of uh, both informal and uh, formal uh, women's civil society um, who have been uh, responders to humanitarian crises, uh, but also, uh, uh, sorry, there is some uh, background noise here. and. Um, uh, also politically and uh, active. Of course, uh, the sociologists and uh, researchers are already picking up as well the uh, gendered, uh, disproportionate gendered impact of some of the structural vulnerabilities caused by the war, uh, such as unemployment, uh, such as increasing poverty um, among predominantly women, also women of the older population, uh, that has to do with the uh, type of pensions that Ukraine uh, allows for its uh, elderly population. It also has a lot to do with the fact fact that um, the type of attacks that uh, happened by uh, Russian uh, air strikes actually uh, address mostly um, infrastructure uh, around uh, care and uh, reproductive care, uh, hospitals, uh, schools, uh, kindergartens. And um, in a way, uh, this war is also not only trying to weaken uh, our population overall, but uh, weaken uh, the infrastructure that would allow us to support um, and recover uh, from, from the war. And uh, this has uh, impacts uh, on women mostly uh, because the kind of work that has to do with uh, healthcare or uh, support, uh, psychological support uh, for um, soldiers that come back from the front lines. Um, 
is available through the state services, uh, sometimes on a limited scale, but when it's not available, it is being picked up um, uh, by women. And uh, the increase of uh, invisible care work uh, has been identified as one of the main um, potential barriers for longer term uh, engagement of women in uh, economic life, uh, in political life, and in other spheres of uh, society going forward. That is why it's uh, very important to identify and track these challenges at this point, and to focus not only on uh, security and uh, well-being of society uh, through, you know, bomb shelters and uh, air defense, but also think about comprehensive holistic security. The concept of human security is also very uh, something that uh, feminist activists advocate uh, very actively, which includes um, uh, socioeconomic uh, safety and uh, prevention of feminization of poverty and prevention of poverty by population overall, um, and making sure that uh, our economy and uh, our social services are there to actually support uh, the population um, from, from becoming vulnerable over long extended uh, periods of time. And those are all uh, issues that have to do directly with gender equality and uh, with uh, a feminist uh, agenda for peace, for a sustainable peace in Ukraine. Thank you for that. Uh, time is almost up, so I want to ask you both one last question and start with you, Julia. First, if you could say something short about how you considered the role of the EU during 2013 and 14. That's a question from the audience. And also include a few words about what you see as key uh, in moving towards peace in Ukraine. I believe that the question is about uh, the role of you in the protests, because this is the years 2013-14. And uh, I think that uh, at that time, it was very important for Ukrainians uh, to see the support from you that uh, the protest started as uh, kind of... Um, against this move uh, from you to Russia and when you said that they uh, support Ukrainians it was very important uh, especially symbolically that uh, the protesters uh, saw you on their side uh, so I, I hope I understood the um, question correctly that it was about the protests and then uh, about um, and the peace um, this is the <laughs> the hardest question because uh, when there is a war it's uh, even so difficult to imagine uh, what can help but uh, as i said uh, for ukrainians and uh, for me as a historian who was studying um, all the time the genocides and uh, the second world war uh, I think that the question of justice, it's so important and uh, uh, Russia never really went through the process of uh, any kind of uh, uh, justice. <laughs> so I think that it would be the, the first uh, demand for Ukraine, but in order to have justice, we have to have peace. We have to be in the state when no one is bombing Ukraine and how to get to this. I guess that uh, here the whole world has to help Ukraine. And uh, this is the solidarity. This is a lot of pressure on Russia with all kinds of sanctions because we see that those sanctions which we have, they don't work. Half of the uh, elements in the weapons Russia is producing or has been producing during these two years, they come from uh, the West. Uh, so the West is really helping Russia to to continue the war in a way that uh, is very very strange because uh, everyone still helps the, the Ukraine. So I, I think that the support has to be bigger and more serious, and uh, it's only together we can win and then have justice and to ha then have some kind of a, a chance for a better future. Thank you for that. Can you, Oksana, also uh, say a few short words about what you see as keys for a peaceful development? Yeah. 
if Oksana is still here. Yeah. Maybe she fell out. Maybe she fell out. Seems like it. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, that happened to me some minutes ago too. Yeah. But yeah, we are over time. And we are very lucky that we have uh, had a huge audience today. We didn't know if you were going to find us here online, but but we have a lot of listeners. And uh, thanks for the question that we received. Yes. Now yeah, I we have Oksana that. now. Yeah, now. she is back. Okay. Can you, Oksana? Sorry, I was disconnected for a while. Yes. Yeah, I can fine. hear you. Yes. Fine. Could you could you just say a few short words about what you see uh, as in, uh, keys for a peaceful development in Ukraine? Yes, I uh, was just thinking about the word uh, peace that was also uh, in uh, the preparatory questions. And uh, as someone who has been an activist uh, for peace in Ukraine uh, since 2014, I realized that this concept itself has uh, undergone a lot of transformation and rethinking uh, by Ukrainian uh, society, scholars and activists ourselves. And uh, I think this is a conversation as well that uh, is a global one uh, right now, that uh, peace is uh, in situations of uh, power imbalance uh, is uh, never just about uh, stopping the armed violence, even uh, though this is something what we would really like to see. Um, as, as, as I mentioned, we are suffering from these attacks every day. Um, but peace is more of a, a rethinking of global uh, power relations that allow for this violence to not happen again, but also for justice to be there. And um, this is something I think that Ukrainian society is uh, offering to the world as a conversation that is relevant in a lot of other contexts right now. Uh, at the same time, when we talk about sustainable peace or the world, the world after uh, that we really hope uh, Ukraine wins and regains all of its territories, um, there will be a society living with so many different impacts of this war that uh, was brought upon us. And um, here, uh, feminist uh, thinkers and activists offer uh, a concept of uh, feminist peace, which uh, actually relies on a lot of the... Uh, uh, analysis that I have been mentioning, the uh, importance of uh, reproductive labor, the importance of uh, care work uh, that leads to a particular thinking about economy, a particular thinking of social sphere, social infrastructure. I think we look a lot towards countries like Sweden for examples of how uh, this kind of social order uh, can be organized in ways um, that allows for a healthy maternal break, uh, healthy labor policy, um, access to healthcare, uh, uh, you know, kindergartens, and all this kind of infrastructure that uh, may or may not be available to uh, a lot of Ukrainian uh, population groups uh, after uh, we see the impacts of war on people's economic capacities. So uh, for me, peace is not either or, uh, it's um, both of these things and, and so much more. It's thinking about uh, actually the fact that the kind of life and the kind of society we want to see is uh, not only based on basic security or, and survival, but on existence and thriving of uh, all population groups, uh, diverse groups uh, within the society uh, in Ukraine. And uh, uh, I really wish that we continue to have these conversations and continue to build solidarity because we have a lot to learn from each other and from feminists in, in other contexts as well. Thank you so much, both Oksana and Julia, for participating and contributing with important notes on how we can understand Russia's war against Ukraine and how we can move forward. Det börjar bli dags att runda av och som vanligt i fredspodden så brukar vi summera med vad vi som programledare tar med oss. Så Kerstin, kan inte du säga något kort? Vad tar du med dig från det här första avsnittet i seminarieserien Fredspodden Live? Nej, men jag tycker att det var, vi kom in på, på vad det här med rättvisa och fred och sanning. Och alla de här momenten är väldigt viktiga i en försoningsprocess. Även om vi inte är där än eftersom liksom, kriget pågår i full skala. Eh, men jag, jag, ja, och hur liksom propagandan spelar in i det här med sanningen. Och jag skulle gärna ha hört mer om just så här varför baltstäderna... Oh, 
Baltländerna har gått en annan väg eller liksom varför Ryssland. Ah, det finns så många spännande saker jag skulle prata vidare om men nu måste jag hosta så jag lämnar över till dig. Ja, jag håller med. Det finns verkligen så mycket vi hade kunnat stanna kvar vid och prata mer om. Jag tar också med mig massa olika saker men jag tänker att bli, att bli påmind om en sak specifikt och det handlar just om vikten av att förstå konflikter och dess liksom, historiska perspektiv, kontexten bakom konflikten. Konfliktanalys är ju grundläggande för att förstå konflikter men också grundläggande för att kunna skapa fred och jag tänker att man ofta tänker på för det här kan man göra på olika nivåer och man då kanske ofta tänker på liksom de stridande parterna eller grupperna men att kontexten och kontextanalysen är minst lika viktig, alltså var konflikten kommer ifrån och de grundläggande orsakerna. Så det tar jag med mig och en massa andra saker. Men som tur är så kommer vi få möjlighet att prata mycket mer om hur vi kan närma oss fred i Ukraina, fred och rättvisa, för rättvisa är ju jätteviktigt för fred och vad som behövs för det i kommande delar av den här seminarieserien och nästa gång är ju faktiskt redan nästa vecka den 25, 25 januari, eller hur Kerstin? Då ska vi prata om diplomatins möjligheter. Ja, men vi ska vi göra det. Och för de som bor i Stockholm är ni varmt välkomna till Arena-gruppen som sitter vid Dansens hus ungefär. Vad heter det? Heter det Normans? Nej, det heter Norra Bantorget. Där kommer vi träffas för det var också så att Annika och då och Isa kan ta sig dit. Så då ses vi live, riktigt live, men också online för de som inte är i Stockholm, såklart. Och Annika Söder är då diplomat och medlare. Så, och Isak är väl insatt i de medlems, medlingsförsök och, eh, som pågår när det handlar om Ukraina och Ryssland och låsningar na, och så vidare. Så att jag ser jättemycket fram emot torsdag nästa vecka också. Och jag är jätteglad att vi är igång med vår eh, seminarieserie Fredspodden Live. Ja, och mer information om seminarieserien går jag att hitta både på svenskafreds.se och i våra kanaler i sociala medier. Det här samtalet kommer gå att lyssna på i efterhand. Stort tack till alla som har lyssnat idag. Vi hoppas att ni kommer vilja fortsätta lyssna under den här våren med den här seminarieserien. Men tack för idag. Vi hörs snart igen. Tack så mycket. Tack snälla alla. Hey. Thank you and goodbye.